All right, here we go. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here today this early and for your interest in UX and the brain. My name is Celia. I have a PhD in psychology and the director of user experience at Epic Games. And I've uh, previously worked at LucasArts and Ubisoft. This session is meant as a follow-up to my last year GTC, bless you, talk about how neuroscience and UX can impact design. Since uh, it seemed to generate some interest, I wanted to go uh, to do a deeper dive on one of the critical aspects of a game's user experience, the UX of onboarding and player engagement. Uh, lots of stuff to do, so I'm going to speed up a little bit. Uh, as in an introduction, I will quickly reintroduce some neuroscience notion as well as UX notions that I tackled last year, just to make sure everyone is on the same page. So I apologize for the repetition here. But the user experience entails how a person perceives and interacts with the product and the satisfaction and emotions elicited by this interaction. It takes its roots in cognitive science, human factors, and human-computer interaction. UX also designates an umbrella discipline whose objective is to evaluate and improve the experience of the targeted users of a product in development. It includes UX design, interaction design, user research, UX strategy, et cetera. Although UX should not be the concern, should be the concern of everyone on the team, not just a UX team. Quick reminder about how the brain learns. Discovering and mastering a video game is a learning experience for the user. It requires mental efforts. This is why it's important to understand how the brain learns to craft a compelling onboarding experience, one worth putting effort into, one that will matter to the audience. Anything the brain processes and learns originates from a perceived input and changes the memory of the subject. The quality of the processing, therefore the quality of the retention, depends highly on the attentional resources applied, which are also dependent on the emotions and motivation felt by the players. In sum, to improve the experience of the players, video game developers must take into account the perception, memory, and attention are limitations of the brain, as well as the emotions and, emotion and motivation felt by the player. Disclaimer, this is highly simplified. The brain doesn't work in that sort of buckets. Uh, the brain is even more complex than game development, uh, so imagine. Um, so regarding perception, I'm going to quickly remind uh, a little bit of each. Um, perception evolves, involves all the mental processes that allow us to sense our environment and construct uh, our own mental representations of it. Perception is not a passive window to the world. It is a construct of the mind into meaningful patterns. Perception is highly influenced by previous knowledge, expectations, or like in, the, in this example, context. The input at the center can be perceived as a B or as a 13, depending on the context you read it. Another example illustrating that perception is subjective. <laughs> Contrary to older people like me, uh, the save icon doesn't mean anything to the youngsters as they do not have a mental representation based of previous experience uh, with this object from the past until they learn what it symbolizes when using a computer. So designers have to keep in mind that what they perceive might not be what their audience will perceive exactly. About memory, uh, memory allows us to encode, store, and retrieve information. There are three components of memory. You have the sensory memory. It's part of perception. It retains sensory information for a very short period of time, such as a fraction of a second, uh, without it being consciously processed. For example, the persistence of vision is due to sensory memory, and it allows us to perceive a 24 image per second display as a uninterrupted animation. It requires attention for the, for the animation to go to working memory, which is a short-term component that allows for temporary storage and manipulation of a very limited amount of new or already stored information. The system maintains active mental representation necessary to perform a task. The working memory requires heavy attentional resources and therefore is very limited. It is also easily disturbed, so please put your phones in silent mode. Long-term memory is a multiple system component that allows us to store knowledge of events and facts, as well as skills, the know-how, and conditioned responses. The long-term memory has no known limits in space and it can potentially store information for a lifetime. 
However, memory lapses are fairly common. Talking about memory lapse, here's the forgetting curve, illustrating how memory retention declines exponentially with time. Retention of information, especially if not engaging emotionally or meaningfully, can be very fragile. Some variables have an impact on the strength and quality of the encoding and storage of information, such as the level of processing and the amount of repetition over time. Not only the brain is prone to memory lapses, but it can also distort memories. Because of these limitations, uh, developers cannot really rely on players' memory. They shouldn't. Um, about attention, our senses are continuously bombarded by multiple inputs for, uh, from our environment. Attention entails allocating more cognitive resources to process selected inputs while the others will be ignored. That's selective attention. The brain's attentional resources being very limited, we do not methodically process all the available information from the environment, we don't scan the environment. Instead, attention works like a spotlight, focusing resources to process and retain particular elements and neglecting the other inputs, such as and when you're in a, a party, it's called the cocktail effect, cocktail party effect, and a loud party can focus to just listen one conversation and ignoring all the rest. And as there's a fire alarm that rings, and it's going to draw your attention away from it. So when elements are unattended, they're unlikely not perceived at all in a phenomenon called inattentional blindness. Uh, this phenomenon was best illustrated in the well-known gorilla experiment in which you had to count basketball passes of the white team, leading you to not see the gorilla passing by. I usually show that video, but now everybody knows it, so it's not fun anymore. Um, but uh, even though a lot of people now understand that multitasking is a myth, there are still a lot of games that fire multiple inputs at the same time during the onboarding. And that games where an NPC is talking to you while you learn how to drive a car, for example. When multitasking or cognitive overload occurs, it affects engagement, focus, and therefore hinders the quality of learning, which can affect your player's engagement. So I did my session last year showing some UX heuristics or guidelines for usability and for what I, I like to call the game flow that can help you remember what elements are important to avoid confusing your players and to increase the fun potential of your game. Uh, today, we're going to look more deeply into the onboarding, the first time user experience. So, there you go. Why is onboarding important? Here's a chart showing the cumulative playtime in Warframe. Note that the data is compressed on the x-axis, so the hours are not linear. It shows that 80% of all players ever kept playing after one hour, which means that in a free-to-play game, you will lose about 20% of your audience during the first time user experience, the onboarding. And this is a pretty good example. Warframe is a successful, successful F2P game. So imagine how this curve looks like for a less successful game. I didn't want to poo-poo on anyone, so um, just to show a dramatic chart, but I do encourage you to go to Steam Spy uh, to figure it out by yourself if you haven't done so already. Engaging your audience within the first minutes of play is a delicate endeavor and has become a critical aspect of development in the area of free-to-play games. If your game fails to captivate your audience's attention quickly, there won't be any retention challenges to even care about. Don't get me wrong, a great onboarding is not a guarantee for success. After the short-term engagement, mid- and long-term engagement will be tremendously important too. But we're we'll focused uh, more on the first hour of play here. So during the onboarding part of your game, uh, you need to get your message right when the players are discovering the game and remove barriers. Um, then you have to make sure players can quickly learn the main mechanics of your game and engage them through clear goals and progression path they need to take. Too often, the transition from the tutorial part to the real game is not engaging because it lacks meaning. So these elements are not really separated, and they're not even linear. The player can discover, learn, and get immersed at any time, even long after the onboarding part, of course. Um, so it doesn't mean that you should not be preoccupied with motivation mechanisms during the discovery part, the very first steps, or that players cannot be immersed uh, within the first minutes of play. Also, learning is a central part of the onboarding here, but it happens in all these steps all the time. 
because playing a game is a learning experience. That's why learning principles are going to be at the core of this presentation. Bless you. Developing effective materials that facilitate learning requires an understanding of the principles underlying how people learn, which are, the first one is the behavioral psychology principle. It's basically conditioning, um, which affects implicit memory. So Pavlov, Skinner, Thorndike, you've heard these names. They only looked at stimuli and references, so the input and the output, without really bothering with what happens in the mind, the black box. Uh, dominance of behaviorism began to wane in the 70s, and cognitive psychology took over. Yeah. They wanted to look into the black box with an information processing approach. Perception, attention, memory, all the stuff we just talked about. They also introduced the notion of an executive control. Lastly, according to the constructivist viewpoint, learning is a process of people actively constructing knowledge. So that's people like Jean Piaget, if you heard of him, uh, or Seymour Papert's uh, research with Logo. Do you remember the Logo programming language with the turtle? Yeah, I'm not that old. I mean, I guess you are old, like me. <laughs> so that's active learning. Uh, sorry for the lame picture here, but just try uh, to Google search active learning. Uh, there's pretty lame pictures in there. Anyway, so these different learning principles will be used as perspective throughout this presentation. So the first part uh, of the talk will emphasize on one of the most important aspects of the brain with respect to onboarding, managing the player's attention. Learning to play a new game necessitates a different cognitive effort than mastering a game. A new player is not necessarily deeply motivated to play and has many new things to understand. So the game must engage its audience quickly and efficiently. Every point of fiction can turn the player away at that stage, especially, again, with free-to-play games, since they don't require previous commitment. You don't buy the game. So to remove barriers, you need to manage the player's attention. To do that, you need to understand how working memory works, the component that stores and manipulates information. It is composed of two slave systems. One system is responsible for processing visual, spatial, and motor tasks. Another is responsible for processing phonological tasks. So it's nearly impossible to do two tasks from the same slave system. And usually to show that, I uh, bring people, someone on stage, ask this person to sing a song while trying to spot verbs in a text. Uh, can't do that at GDC here, but my colleagues at Ubisoft have been um, <laughs> experiencing that painfully. Um, and this is where you can actually see that it's very difficult to do two tasks from the same bucket, in that case, phonological task. Uh, you can do one of each. So I, can, I also ask the person to sing a song with lyrics, but instead of spotting verbs, I ask the person to draw a picture. In that case, it's much easier, uh, but still um, less efficient as just doing one task. It can be trained, but only to a certain limit. When attention is divided, for example, when driving while having a conversation over the phone, it requires more cognitive load to process the different information, therefore leading to more fatigue and mistakes. The more demanding a specific task uh, is in terms of cognitive load, for example, mental calculation, the less people can allocate mental effort to accomplish another task, even though simple, such as pressing a button when a red light goes off. By the way, this is a real experiment from Kahneman in 1973. Subsequently, the more attention is allocated to um, a task or information, the better it will be retained. So if you want to teach the player something, you really want to avoid divided attention. All right, so here's an example of divided attention, or when we try to require divided attention from the player, um, from Fortnite. Fortnite is an action-building game with RPG elements. It's currently in live uh, alpha stage. Disclaimer, the footage shown in this, vi in this video is from UX testing, uh, so it's super compressed because we don't need to have high-resolution images. Uh, and of course, it's very early in development. Uh, and in all the videos I will show you, you will see a red, red circle overlay. This is eye tracking. So it's showing where the players are looking at, which is super important for attentional resources. 
So in this video, I'm going to show you the player chose to play as a constructor. Uh, so his role is to stay close to the fortifications, to repair them and reinforce them. However, he's running around uh, because, well, smashing zombies is pretty fun. So you'll see an important message popping at the top telling the player that the fort is being attacked, that he should go back to repair it. But the player does not even look at this information, uh, which is an important mechanic to be successful in the game. He is not dividing his attention because dealing with enemies is taking all his attention and resources, just like in the gorilla experiment. Therefore, it is critical uh, during the discovery part of the game to draw the player's attention to the elements uh, that they need to learn to enjoy their first steps. Given that all of our mental processes are using the same limited attentional resources, the developers must mind the cognitive load uh, the game demands from the player, especially, again, during the onboarding part when the players have a lot of new information to process. So uh, according to the cognitive load theory, learning can be hindered if it requires cognitive resources exceeding the working memory limits. The working memory span is three more or less items on average. Uh, an item can be an action or a thought process that requires effort. It's very vague. I'm sorry, I cannot be more specific than that. Um, but three items processed at the, at the same time is really the maximum when in uh, learning mode, so discovering everything. Because new tasks have a much higher cognitive load than familiar or automated ones. Think the, about the efforts it took you to learn how to drive. Uh, the first time you, know, you, had, you really had to uh, mentally process everything to build up intentional resources. Uh, but once trained, like later, uh, when you really have that going and you can just sing along while you drive, uh, it's automated, so you don't have to really allocate too much resources in there. So same thing for the player. The first time he learns about a mechanic, it's going to require a lot of cognitive load. Later uh, down the line, when the player really had that going, uh, it's trained to doing it, it's more automated, it does not require as much cognitive load. So three items could be one using an ability uh, to, to react to an enemy attack, like analyzing enemy movement pattern, while three dodging enemy projectile. That's only three. So if the controls of your game are peculiar, that would count as another item. So um, check this UX test video from um, Paragon. So Paragon is our new, uh, MOBA. Again, very early, it's UX test um, footage. Um, check out that. So this is the very first game that the player is playing. And so it starts uh, it's entering in the arena right away. Even though we have that big flashing red thing telling the player, hey, you should, you know, you can actually have an ability right now. You can upgrade one here. But the player doesn't even look at it. It just jumps right into the arena. It's flashing. We're really trying to draw attention to that. And he's trying a few things. Oh, there's an enemy there. He's running towards the enemy. Trying to figure that out, aiming, dodging the enemy's attack, so minions. Sometimes it's gonna pop down, you know, looking at the thing that is blowing, but it's not even gonna process this information at that time. So during onboarding, mining the cognitive load is critical. Because the challenge will not be seen as mastery by the player, it's gonna be seen as annoyance. Or worse, the player will be put in a failure condition. This is likely going to create stress that now we can capture with biometrics tools so we can actually see that, that stress. And that can lead the player to simply stop playing. And he's gonna blame it on the game. So F2P game um, must mine the cognitive load in working memory. There are many ways to reduce the cognitive load here, um, such as distribute learning over time, which we're gonna see later. You can also use affordances to limit the cognitive load. Uh, what is intuitive does not need to be learned, therefore requires less attentional resources to process. In design, an affordance gives or provides something that helps a user to do something. Now, four kinds of affordances in UX design. I'll give an example of each uh, right after. You have a physical affordance. That's a feature that helps users in doing a physical action in the interface. For example, a button that is large enough so that users can click on it accurately. 
You have cognitive affordance. It enables thinking, learning, understanding, knowing about something. For example, a button label that helps user know what will happen if they click on it. Form follows function is a cognitive affordance. You have sensory affordance. It's a design feature that helps users sense something. For example, a label, font size, large enough to be discerned. And you have functional affordance. It's a design feature that helps users accomplish a task. For example, a sort functionality in an inventory. There's a subtlety. Uh, the perceivable part of an affordance is a signifier. So as a designer, you care about placing signifiers to enable the players to perceive the affordances. So physical affordance facilitates physically doing something, such as a handle on a door physically helps you operating the door. So you want a button to be large enough to tap on it, to click on it, or you want two buttons to not be too close to each other to avoid misclicks. See the fit slow for these things. Or on mobile, interactive areas to be comfortable to reach. A cognitive affordance, like we saw, facilitates or enables thinking about something. They help users to know what to do. So the pool handle offers both cognitive and physical affordance because it provides a physical means for pulling as well as a visual indication that pulling is the required action. In Fortnite, you have three different symbols representing three types of materials. Remember, you can build and craft. Uh, and how many of, them, of each uh, the player has. So that helps players understand what they can do with it. Cognitive affordance can go wrong. Uh, this is called false affordance. It is when the perceived affordance is not the one intended given the functionality. Um, here's the example of uh, the axe in Fortnite. Um, so you have a lot of uh, weapons and tools. You actually have one uh, tool that is really effective for harvesting, just one. It's the pickaxe. But you have all the other elements you can have are melee weapons. So the axe is a melee weapon. Of course, originally it was not the, intent, um, the design intention to put an axe in the player's hand and say, no, you cannot actually chop off trees with that. Um, initially, they wanted to have one specific tool for each specific thing you can uh, harvest, like the axe for the tree, the sledgehammer for a wall, and stuff like that. But it was too demanding, the players didn't like that, it was not really fun, so they removed that functionality. And there you end up with a, uh, a false affordance because of that, because now players can have an axe but it has to be used for meleeing and not for chop of trees. So false cognitive affordance misinform and mislead the players, and then it makes it much harder to teach them the right thing, and it's frustrating for the players on top of it. So you really have to pay attention with that. And that that's really the sort of things that uh, happen just, it happens because the design changed, so you have to um, stay focused on that. The sensory affordance, an easy one, it helps players sense in something, seeing, hearing, feeling. Um, this is what we call the perceptibility of signs and feedback. Um, it includes noticeability, discernibility, legibility in case of text, and audibility in case of sound. So in that case, of course, that's a bug. It's not by design. Um, the, you, when you die, you can click to respond, but the text is uh, hidden um, behind uh, a... Uh, uh, health bar, and so the player doc cannot perceive it. Also, as a more subtle one, in Fortnite you have a home base and you have buildings, and these buildings increase your stats, and you, see more, you can even more increase your stats by slotting workers in there. So when you click on the plus button there to slot a worker, it's, uh, it was showing the workers you could slot, including the ones already slotted elsewhere, subtly indicated by that red corner mark. I'm sure you saw it, right? Of course, players didn't see it. And on this video, you're going to see, um, you'll see the player going back and forth in the two buildings trying to slot a worker, not realizing he's slotting, unslotting the same one over and over. Like, oh, let's add a worker there. Let's take this one. Oh, there's, I, I thought I had one in the comment center. All right, let's, let's put this And it's gone from the hospital. Uh, <laughs> so we have to pay attention to that. <clears throat> Functional affordance, um, this is one that ties usage to, to usefulness. 
Uh, this is when you add a functionality, such as sorting uh, in categories to help the player find something. Uh, filtering, in that example, you see, well, there's filtering, but there's also a pinning um, a mechanism, so it can help player craft something faster. If you want something, you can pin it on the HUD so you don't have to do that again and again. So designers have to make sure, so this is really useful, but you have to make sure that um, the functional affordance you're designing is really gonna be useful to the player uh, and not just add noise or complexity. Uh, refer you to the Pareto principle, it's like the 80-20 principle. 80% of the time, people use only 20% of the functionalities. So be careful not to add too much stuff that peers are not gonna use. Some interfaces feel easy to use while others drive us nuts and requires manuals or sticky notes in that example. Uh, it will greatly help remove barriers for your player's first steps in your game uh, if you have good affordances, or should I say, good signifiers. Because if it doesn't, you'll need tutorial texts, or players will have to make an extra effort, which they often don't, uh, won't do it, uh, to figure out on forums how to use a certain, certain functionality. So the key takeaway here for discovery um, is you have to mind the attention, the attention limitations and the cognitive load for the player. Your main objective is to make sure that your game is gonna be easy to make sense of and to remove barriers. And as this is by design, but if it's not by design, remove all the barriers at that moment. Use, and this is an example, the usability principles. So we saw um, a lot of UX design principles, actually the affordances, for example. All right, so learning. Although learning by doing is recognized as being one of the most efficient ways of learning, especially when it comes to an interactive experience, tutorial texts are still frequently used to teach the main components of a game. That's easier. Um, uh, research suggests that we learn best when we are cognitively engaged and active, when learning experiences are meaningful and socially interactive, and when learning is guided by a specific goal. So let's take a look at active tutorials. So we saw that last time, that it's really, really important. So i uh, put it, uh, that here again, but I'm using uh, new examples. The deeper you're gonna process an information, focus your attention, the better you're gonna learn and retain. So that means you need to give context to the player. It means the player um, should be able to learn by doing. Uh, and you need meaning. It has to be worthwhile now for the player, for his life, uh, for his mission, for his goal. All right, so here's an example uh, where you don't have any context. You cannot do the things you're taught at that moment, and there's no meaning. So this is, again, from Paragon Alpha. This is the loading screen. So look at the, um, the eye tracking. So the player is waiting for the game to load. Is not really reading all the things, and is, is especially not reading uh, the match basics. That is really the most important information for him. It's the first time he's going to play the game, so he needs to understand what are the, um, the subtlety of, of Paragon. It's just like going back and forth, not really reading. He's just, just going to look at a few controls, and that's it. Here's another example. Um, when you have context, so it means that you can do it while you're taught, but there's no meaning. So in Fortnite, you can build, and what we saw is like players were building uh, walls all around them, and then we're like, oh shit, I can't get out. Um, you can edit doors in Fortnite, but they didn't know how to do it, so they were just like sliding down a door. Uh, and so we really needed to teach them uh, how to edit doors because it's really important to enjoy the game. And so um, this is what they, uh, the team did uh, at the beginning. So you have context and no meaning. You listen to what the narrator says in that example. So players found the gate. You found the gate. Let's close it. Press E to deploy your Atlas storm suppression device. Just a heads up, the husks aren't going to like it when you start closing that gate. You might want to build up some strong defenses around it to slow the enemy down. Just this one time, I'm going to protect an area you should build in to protect your atlas. I'll beat. Alright, so the player has to... A good wall is a thing of beauty, but don't forget about doors. Yes, doors. When there's a wall in the way, choose doors. Brought to you by the Building Submenu Awareness Society and the letter G. He heard us. Probably. It looks like they know we're here. Really the Check your mini map to see what direction the enemies will be coming from. Build your defenses accordingly. <laughs> 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 
of course, he didn't do it. Uh, he built that uh, box around the thing he had to protect, and then when the the, the enemies are uh, coming, he's actually like, oh shit, I cannot really see what's going. So what he did is he placed a, um, a stair stairwell so you could climb up the enemies. A lot of players were doing that, so we're like, shit, uh, it's not working. Um, still, you have context here, but it's not really meaningful, and there's a lot of information going on here. So what the team did afterwards, uh, they tried to bring more meaning, and this is how it looks like now. just beyond this wall. Let's use edit mode to add a door. Hit G, click on the center panel, and the panel below it. Success. So now we know that the player do it, and so he really processed information. He was actively doing it. Uh, so this is when you actually have meaning. So you want to avoid that as much as possible. Of course, you cannot avoid that all the time. Uh, and you want to try to have more learning by doing. And if you can add uh, meaning, it's even, it's even better. Uh, but sometimes it means that you have to put an obstacle in front of the player, and it has to overcome it. And usually players, they hate tutorials. And they're like, this is bullshit. I hate it. But the problem is if they don't have these tutorials, uh, they are more likely to, uh, to leave the game. So even if they don't like it, you might to have to not make them happy. But at least they're going to learn the mechanics of the game and keep playing. Another thing to remember here, please, please avoid punishing states dur during onboarding. During onboarding only. Uh, and I'm talking to you, Bloodborne and Dark Souls lovers out here. Uh, <laughs> if it's not clearly the main pillar of the game, punishments, you should never punish while they are learning about something. You can punish later, it's totally fine, but not while they're learning it. Why? Because players who die or, have, or are, are having difficulties during the onboarding are less likely to retain. This is actually what we found out looking into analytics data from Fortnite's Alpha with our hardcore gamers. Um, out there. So um, if they ha were having too uh, much difficulty or dying too often, they were actually more likely to leave the game. Again, your hardcore players might whine if they find the game too easy in the beginning. Still, they will more likely keep playing. So don't get crazy with your difficulty curve. Learn about the game. Uh, learning about the game is already challenging enough for the brain. But sometimes you just cannot provide context. Uh, for example, in loading screens. Uh, if you use loading screens to teach, which you should because loading screens are boring, uh, there are ways to make it easy on the cognitive load. This is a screen, again, very, very early um, a PVP prototype. It was the first time uh, the team was actually trying to do a UX test with it. So they put a loading screen there to teach about how you have to do in that mode. Um, but the first loading screen, there was way too much information to read. Um, and it was going too much into details that didn't make sense really to the players who didn't know anything about this mode. It was too much uh, about the what, not enough about the why or how. Players were actually looking more at the cool art than um, about the text. Um, so you want to have like, so again, they just like hack that in last minute to make to remove some text and trying to make it uh, easier to, to understand. Because of the curse of knowledge, we have a tendency to explain by getting too much into details. Uh, probably doing that myself today, apologies for that. So explaining more about how to do all the things instead of mining the cognitive load, um, um, explain more about how to do the things uh, because you have to mine the cognitive load of the player. They are discovering all these things, so uh, they care more about the why they're doing it, not about the details. So if you are lo using the loading screens, do not explain more than three things, remember the working memory, and try to focus on the why rather than the how what. Using loading screens to occupy players uh, is a good thing, though, because waiting is painful. And it, also, uh, it is also a matter of perception. For example, waiting times will seem shorter if there is a progression bar that has animation on it, if this progress bar accelerates rather than decelerates or stops us. That's dreadful. Um, so if players have something to do while waiting, 
uh, it's, it's better instead of looking at an empty screen. So do use the loading screen to give information uh, to players, but they won't read it if there's too much. Or if they do read it, they're not going to remember it. So remember the working memory limitations. Try to stick to uh, three elements to process and focus on the why. The why. Why do you want to do that? The purpose of these things is really meaningful to, to us as humans. So think your onboarding and tutorial through player's lens. It's more important to tease um, to the player the, the, the why, the purpose, rather than uh, get into the details. If you motivate players enough, then they will pay attention on how to accomplish a certain goal. Then uh, they're going to look at more into the details and look at the interactive elements they need uh, to play with to get to that goal. And so when you test your game, also try to see if the players get to the why. So show what I, what I do, for example, if they, they play the onboarding and um, at, in the survey at the end of their experience, I show a screenshot um, of the game with an interactive element. So example, for example, something the players need to activate to do something in the game. So I show an image of it and I ask them, so what is this? How did you use it? Why was it important for your mission? So um, I also ask the players what was the objectives of the mission? Did they get why they were doing all this? Um, don't just ask them, did you find the objectives clear? Because they're usually going to say yes. But if you ask them, OK, so what were the objectives? They usually don't get it all right. Um, so always ask them about the purpose of completing a mission to verify that they actually got it. Always make sure that the players get to the why. That's really the most important thing. So. Remember, for all that you will teach, the deeper the process, the better the retention. Numerous studies in psychology show that learning is not simply a passive registration of information. Learning that sticks requires active, minds-on learning. Simply put, the more the brain puts efforts into something, the more it remembers and understands it. So it's, it's nearly scientific. But overall, the more you process information, so if you really practice by doing or teach others about something you learned, it's going to be way more easy for you to remember, to retain that information that if you just read about it. Um, so even with all that science, um, the players are going to be um, forgetting about stuff. So we need to understand better how memory um, lapse works. So if you remember, me memory allows, allows us to encode, store, and retrieve or recall information. Therefore, three factors can lead to oblivion. It can be an encoding deficit. This is when the information was superficially encoded because of a lack of attention or because of a failed elaboration process. So workaround for that is draw attention, make the player process information, do it, like be emotional. It could be a storage deficit. The information was correctly encoded, but it weakens with time. So you need to uh, give to repeat all the mechanics and try to make them repeat in different contexts. It's even richer. And lastly, you can have a recall deficit. Um, this is when the information is available in memory, but it's momentarily inaccessible. You have the broken link. Um, so to avoid that, you can give reminders to have the player remember about something. So here uh, is an example from uh, for age deficit. So for the encoding deficit, um, here's an example in from Fortnite. Um, in Fortnite, by design, you cannot repair weapons. And so we have we're live right now in early alpha, um, and many players in the alpha population are asking how to repair weapons. Uh, they're posting that on the forums all the time, like, how, how the hell do you repair weapons? Um, you can't. So the team decided to put the player in a situation where the weapon breaks right at the beginning of the game so we can tell them, hey, you cannot repair weapons. So this is what you need to craft. So that's the video of it. No! Oh. Your gun's broken. Your drone can't repair crafted items, so we'll need to craft a new gun. Let's search the cave for the resources we'll need to craft a new weapon. All right, so 
the player experiences that, the weapon is breaking, you hear it, you see it, you can't repair it. Here's what the player was saying after um, that experience on the surveys. They're like, I'm, I'm confused about you know, how to repair objects in Fortnite. There was no easy way to find how to repair weapons. And you're like, ah, shit, it didn't work. Uh, and this is because of uh, <laughs> an encoding deficit. Again, it was not asking the player to put too much, uh, not enough cognitive load into that. And so pff, they didn't really encode it. That was a beautiful sound that just made. Um, so <laughs> the storage deficits. Um, a pinning functionality, for example, allows the player to not store the information about what he needs to craft, but instead always have it on the HUD. So you avoid the storage deficit. That's a functional affordance. It remove, uh, removes memory load. When it's missing, you don't have that pinning functionality. Players actually have difficulty storing uh, the ingredients, even if it's just that like, one ingredient is just a few numbers to remember. Um, player don't, it's just hard to just remember one number is not you know, just one. Um, so, of course, it's not bad design. Uh, again, it's something that the, um, the, game, um, the dev team is hacking through so we can test it. Um, but here's what happened. So that's a very new feature. Uh, it's ugly. It's going to be way better. But uh, right now, it's early prototype. So it's the outpost. It allows you to upgrade your pickaxe, which is the harvesting tool. So it's super important in Fortnite. And so to do that, you need to have ingredients. And we don't have the pinning right now for that. So the player has to. It's actually hidden. There's a lot of problems here. Uh, we know about this. And you need to look at the build. So it's, it's looking at how many the item you need. So you can get it. It goes back. So it's already the third time it's looking at that thing, even though it's not that much information. It's just one. It just needs one ingredient. It goes back, get it. And lastly, you got it. So you can see, like, even if it's just one information to retain, it's not too <laughs> heavy. I know how to use that. Uh, it's still very difficult to retain that information because you're running around, you're doing a lot of different stuff. Uh, so, so this is really showing how impactful it can be to have these uh, sort of uh, reminders like on the head to help the player not store information. Uh, about recall, so in Fortnite, uh, in the first level, we teach players how to craft in a deep way. We, they have to do it. So it's learning by doing. A video of it. Let's craft a better gun for Ramirez, Commander. Open your inventory and select the gun sub menu. Active learning. Good. Information is encoded. That's some great crafting. Reward. Um, and then this is what happened like about 20 minutes later. Uh, the player is uh, thrown into his out, uh, outpost. Uh, he loses all his uh, um, ingredients because he swaps heroes. But anyway, so this is how it happens. He doesn't have anything. And so we drop Be careful. Ingredients. While it's in flux, your outpost is vulnerable to attack. So be ready to defend it. You have to defend it. You only have a stick. But we're giving you ingredients. This you can craft a lot of cool shit. The player is just taking the ingredients, not crafting anything. Still has. I will use thing. this well. And so a little bit later, he's combating. He's still just having a stick. In cutting. And so this is what the player said at the end of the He said, I could not remember how to get to the craft screen. He knew he could do it. He just did not recall how to do it. So we should have given a reminder after like, giving, dropping all the ingredients. We should have tell, told the player, hey, remember, like, press I to uh, get to your inventory, craft a new weapon. So we saw that repetition is important uh, to remember something. Remember the forgetting curve. So this is the projected forgetting curve. Um, so when you teach a feature, you actually don't need to uh, give repetition at, um, at the same um, space. 
you can actually space it out. Teach with feature A, you can give a reminder a bit later, because each time you reteach about something, the forgetting curve is getting smoother. And so, of course, in between these lapses, you can teach another feature. This looks super ugly, but you get the, you get the point. Uh, so reminders are more efficient when spaced out, uh, but also when the context does not stay the same. For example, to teach your players how to use a new weapon, first teach how to shoot steel targets, and then moving targets, and then partly occluded targets, and then moving targets while dodging, etc. You need multi-contextual repetition, and you combine with more um, mechanics to learn. All right, I need to speed up. Um, we talked a lot about cognitive psychology and active learning principles. So let's briefly tackle behavioral psychology here um, to give you an idea of how you can use it. We're talking about classical conditioning. It's when two events ha happen close to each other repeatedly over time. So you hear the bell, and there's the food going on, and you repeat, 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 so then you salivate only when you hear the bell. So that's good. So she's learning, you've been conditioned. So. Um, you implicitly learn to link these. How about this sound? <laughs> you feel conditioned. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of examples of classical conditioning game, uh, usually with the music of Samizan. For example, the music stops in some games when there are no more enemies left to kill. Conditioning can be very powerful uh, to teach some mechanics. It can work very well, like really to uh, a deep level, uh, especially by associating sound with another event. So be nice to your sound designers because you need them. All right, so mind the memory load, mind the memory lapse. Main objective is to make it easy to learn, to do that deep context and meaning, and use learning principle. All right, last part. To truly immerse your audience beyond removing the barriers, you need to mind the game flow, never too easy nor too hard. Mind the emotions including the game feel and motivation. Today, I only talk about motivation uh, since game studios are increasingly in interested in motivation mechanisms. So motivation is not only cool because you're engaged and like you want to do something, but it also helps attention. This is, um, I am from cognitive psychology, uh, development psychology, and um, Jean Piaget is a development psychologist who is uh, trying to understand how children learns and how you know, some uh, cognitive mechanisms come to children. One of these examples is how number comes to children. So it was using a bunch of tasks to test the kids. One of these tasks uh, were to put like, two lines of tokens, one line with more tokens, but it's more compressed, and another line with less tokens, but more spaced out. And he was asking kids, so which, uh, which uh, raw has more tokens? Until six to seven years old, children are actually choosing the bottom um, uh, line because they say it's, it's longer. So they think they have um, more numbers in there. So Jean Piaget was like, okay, kids are a bit stupid. I can see six to seven years old. They don't really have a concept of number. Uh, until another psychologist called Meller changed a little bit the task. Instead, instead of tokens, he used candies. Exact same thing, he said to the kids, hey, there are two lines of candies. Uh, which line has the more candies? And guess what? You're going to take that line for yourself. Surprise! It succeeded at two years old. <laughs> so <laughs> we learn better when we are motivated because we pay attention more. So that's one of the main reasons why it's super important to get your, mo um, your players motivated into learning one of your mechanics of your game. So, how does motivation work? Uh, it's complex, of course, like anything. But you have explicit motivation and implicit motivation. Explicit motivation is you have extrinsic motivation, the rewards, we know about that, you do something, get something. Um, but you have intrinsic motivation as well. So, players' engagement is typically driven by extrinsic motivation, but players, um, because players want to achieve external rewards and avoid the opposite, typically the absence of reward. However, intrinsic motivation is even more powerful for long-term engagement. Research seems to indicate that games that satisfy basic uh, psychological needs for competence, autonomy, and relatedness, this is a self-determination theory, will more likely be engaging. So people and players are driven by an increase of their competence, a sense of progression, autonomy, meaningful choices and self-expression, and relatedness, the social aspect. 
intrinsically motivating experiences are known to be deeply engaging for children and adults alike, uh, as in the experience of flow, in which a person loses his or her sense of time while engaged in an activity. Rings any bells? Um, but there's also implicit motivation, our dirty little secrets, such as life and death drives and power seeking. Uh, you surely also have heard of the brain pleasure centered, triggered by learning and novel novelty among other things, and the brain reward circuitry, well known by casinos. So you need to mine all these things, and it's, again, we're just scratching the surface of that. But here's um, an example of how you can do that. Nintendo is super good in that um, you can tease the players because it's more motiva motivating to get a meaningful re reward uh, than just a pat on the back or to unlock an out-of-context achievement. Tutorial completed, congrats. So in the example of Zelda, um, this is from uh, Phantom Hourglass on DS, before even learning about the existence of a grappling hook, the player starts encountering these poles everywhere. Sometimes you even see a pole next to a chest you cannot reach. And then you get the grappling hook, and then you have that eureka feeling, yeah, this is what the poles were for, and now I can use uh, that new tool to reach the chest I remember from you know, 10 minutes ago. Um, so that's really important in design. And this is the locks and keys. Uh, show the locks before giving the keys. The locks will tease and motivate players to um, figure it out, give them agency, and once they uh, get the key, it will feel uh, way more rewarding because it's a more meaningful and intrinsic impact. Here's another way you can simply tease your players. Um, let's take a look at Fortnite's HUD. Here, so that's the new HUD. The previous HUD from a year ago, you could actually do anything on the HUD. You can place your weapons and, and, and abilities and gadgets anywhere you wanted. Uh, but we saw that players, they were gaining a new ability or a new gadget, and they were not even using it. So we're like, what the fuck? So what the designers did, they redid the HUD, and they compartimented uh, the different elements you have. So you usually don't see the the names uh, is just when you open the inventory. But you see you have one slot for harvesting tool because there's just one harvesting tool. And you have a slot for your weapons and a slot for gadgets and slots for abilities. And this is where you can actually see that, hey, there's another slot and it's empty. It means that I can get something soon. And once you see that the slot is now full, you are more motivated to actually try this, um, try this new gadget. Uh, so that's, that's an easy way uh, to get the players motivated because um, you can see that it's empty and then you see that it's full and so you try it. Um, so to get engagement and long-term motivation, you also need depth. Uh, so this is an example of short-term, mid-term, and long-term motivation uh, with Pokemon. So um, you see that... At the beginning, you need just to win the match. That's your short-term goal, catch more Pokemon. Then mid-term goal is going to be to beat the next trainer and to evolve your Pokemon. And you always have that long-term goal, you know, you got to catch them all and be the Elite Four. Uh, so that's really important to have these, to convey all this depth. But the risk is you don't want it to be too complex and overwhelming for the player. So that's a bit complicated, but you do want to show the depth and the long-term goals. Lastly, I'd like to do a quick uh, digression on social impact on learning. Humans are highly social creatures. This is how we, get, uh, we got to survive. Overwhelmingly, research and education has found that cooperative and collaborative learning environments are optimal. So games in general, and multiplayer games in particular, can really benefit from social learning. But simply having a social partner is not enough, though. The social interaction has to be of a high enough quality that it does not detract from the learning situation. So a good way to do it is mentorship in, uh, mentorship in games, such as EVE and um, uh, Team Fortress 2. So think about how you can meaningfully enable social learning in your game or even outside of the game. After all, social learning with Minecraft happens mainly outside of the game, on YouTube, on Twitch. So to get to immersion, um, mind the emotional response, the complexity versus depth. Um, the main objective there is to tease the player to show the progression path and you can use motivation principles. Again, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm just going through all that very quickly, but just to give you an overall understanding of this. So let's wrap this up. Research, uh, research and science 
of learning are suggests that there are three kinds of engagement. Behavioral engagement, it's like following the rules and instructions. So in our case, it's very close from removing the barriers to making sure uh, the game is usable. Cognitive engagement, investment in learning, um, active learning, and emotional engagement, affective reaction, which is at the core of motivation. So each type of engagement is critical for learning because they all foster staying on task, staying engaged. That's why you need to keep in mind these elements. As always, keep in mind also the limitations of the brain and you can use UX guidelines as a checklist. But this is just a checklist. These, um, it's just ingredients. It's not the recipe. I'm sorry, sadly, all this knowledge can only get you that far. Uh, what we saw are ingredients again. It's not the recipe. The recipe, this is what you're going to have to figure out by tweaking the ingredients. Supercell recently said in an interview that it killed 14 games before it was able to successfully launch its fourth game, Clash Royale. 14. Uh, this is another example. This is showing uh, League of Legends uh, beta versus now. You can see like uh, they had a very huge and awesome UX team there, and you can see all the iteration that went through um, to get there. So at least with these ingredients, uh, it's going to save you time and, to, and have the right, to, uh, right mindset to progress faster through iterations. So good luck. That's it. Uh, I hope this talk was useful to you. I'll post these slides on my blog ASAP, and you will find the references to all the research I was talking about as well. I'd like to warmly thank the Fortnite and Paragon teams for letting me show their rough design and artwork. A special thanks to Pete Ellis, our, our director on Fortnite, who I know is dying a little bit uh, inside each time I'm showing early artwork. <laughs> yes, he lets me do it. Um, a big thank you for uh, you all for waking up early um, and to um, share some UX love with me. So thank you, thank you very much.